What is up and welcome to another edition of the Bruin Bible. Will Decker, your host. Make sure you guys are liking and subscribing the podcast. We are brought to you guys today by our advertisers. Our advertisers are Bell to Bell Fitness, Shator, a realtor out in Arizona, former Bruin alum, and my main man, Howard Chang, a realtor right here in Los Angeles. Let's go through them, guys. Uh, Bell to Bell Fitness is a boxing gym on the West Coast used by their FIT acronym, Fight Inspired Training. My main man, Tony Gonzalez, was the boxing coach for UCLA for over 10 years. He has built this gym on the West Side to learn how to boxing, stay in shape, and get you all the essentials you need to become somebody that is obsessed with boxing and fitness. Make sure to check it out. Go into Belt to Belt Fitness and say you heard about it from the Bruin Bible, and you're going to get a free session with Tony Gonzalez. So make sure to check that out. Shea Tor, my main man. Shea Tor is a real a licensed real estate agent in Arizona and a lifelong Bruin. He's a current Wooden Athletic Fund donor and football season ticket holder. When not selling houses or going to UCLA games, he loves to travel the country checking out different arenas, ballparks, and stadiums. If you're looking to make the move to Arizona or know someone who is, please reach out to our loyal friend, Mr. Shea Tor. His phone number is 602-487-3975. Once again, his number is 602-487-3975. Make sure to check that out. And then the local realtor we got out here, Howard Chang. Howard Chang is a local realtor with the Serene team at EXP Realty. Their team has an office right here in Culver City. Though they help clients buy and sell homes all over the L.A. County and the surrounding areas, Howard and his team do a ton of business and are super in tune with the market, knowing winning strategies to give their clients a competitive advantage, have amazing vendor referrals, are a one-stop shop for anything real estate, and just provide a ton of value for their clients. Howard and his partner, Kyle Draper, are UCLA alums and a huge, huge fans of the UCLA football and basketball programs. You will often see them at games, tailgating and networking and staying involved with the UCLA alumni community. They would love to help any fellow alumni with accomplishing their real estate goals. So if you guys have any real estate needs in the LA area, look no further. Howard is your guy. All right, guys, we're going to go into the episode. What is up and welcome to the Friday edition of the UCLA segment here on the Los Angeles Football Network. Also on 1090 ESPN, the mightier. It's Friday. I got my main man to my right, Mr. Madman. We're cooking up ideas, man. It is the dog days of summer, the proverbial dog days of summer. So we came up with some fun concepts for you guys. We're going to be breaking down the top quarterbacks within the Big Ten Conference, new conference, new quarterbacks. Uh, and we'll see where Ethan Garbers kind of fits in that mix. Maybe he's on the fringe looking in. Maybe he plays his way into that top five. It'll be really fun to kind of see what we do with that. And some schedule talk. But before we get into that, how are we doing, man? How was your 4th of July? Break it all down for me. What was going on uh, in the Madney household for the 4th? Thriller, you know, always great to see you, brother. I know we've, we've had some travels here this uh, these last few weeks over the summer, but uh, so great to see you. Great 4th, you know, it was pretty chill. You know, had a, had one day with the parents, then a couple days with kind of different friend groups. Always nice to kind of reconnect and recharge the batteries with 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 people that you care about around you so really nice there and so excited to be back doing this with you thriller we're gonna turn the the gloom of summer and we're gonna turn it into a fly july okay july is gonna be fly with all of the topics that you and i are, are coming together with i mean thriller i'm an indian american you know without spice you know, nothing happens. So we're, we're dialing up the spice here in the weeks to come prior to the season for our beloved Bruins. My God, you're a poet and you don't even know it, man. I think this is like eight, <laughs> eight mile status, man. Your real name's Clarence out here. I mean, this is going nuts. <laughs> I love it, dude. We got a lot to talk about. The schedule, I, I'm going to be honest with you. This came out today. I was a little bummed, man. I got to be honest with you. We had Georgia, you know, coming potentially to the Rose Bowl. Auburn, a big name SEC brand school coming there, you know, to play, I think, a home and a home, a home and away series with the Auburn Tigers. And you know what we said? We said, nope, we're not going to be doing that. We're doing Utah Utes. Man, haven't seen those guys in like eight months. So it'll be nice. To <laughs> and then, I mean, just the Cal Bears somehow weave their way back into our building. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm salty about Cal. The whole Calimony crap. I'm sick of it. I, I, the last thing I want to do is play them six more times in the next seven years. They need to blow this over a little bit. Like, 
you know, the, the, the two universities can't even look each other in the face right now after what's going on, let alone put, put them on the football field together. I'm tired of Cal. So listen, not only do we lose like maybe one of the biggest recruiting potential weekends we may have in the future with the likes of Georgia coming in, the likes of Auburn coming in, we get the crappy school up north and Berkeley coming down again. <laughs> Talk to me because you may be able to sell this better than what I'm, you know, interpreting it as. I'm not stoked about this. So talk to me about Cal and Utah. Utah, great opponent. I will give them their due. Kyle Whittingham, great coach. But talk to me uh, and maybe, you know, pump some optimism into me about let, these Cal games. Let, let me try and pump some optimism into my main man, the Thriller. Let me, let me try and pump some life into this. By the way, Thriller, salty, spicy. I mean, I love this, the flavor of Thriller right now on these takes. I mean, I think he had some chicken vindaloo th- this evening. I think the spice is boiling up here and laying it out on Cal, which I love. Here's my take. Let me, let me try and take an optimistic view. Everything you said is absolutely correct, Will, but let me try and put sort of an optimistic spin. The reason I kind of like it is twofold. One is because Things have gotten so salty and spicy with Cal. Obviously, the calimony, the contentious situation with the Regents, UCLA going to the Big Ten, Cal having to go to the ACC. This whole notion of little brother has now become big brother. The traditional flagship is no more, and it's UCLA's time. All of this, I think, only dials up the intensity of this rivalry moving forward on the field in the years to come. So it's kind of nice to be able to have now for UCLA a second institutional rival in addition to USC in Cal Berkeley. So number one, it's always nice to kind of get one more rivalry game. And now with all of this sort of modern history and tension, the trash talking, NorCal, SoCal, I think there's going to be a lot of fun in that and a lot of enjoyment that comes with the season. Number two, Will, I think the key here is It also allows the students to kind of have the weekender again, right? Like one of the challenges and and with a lot of students, alumni, fans, the travel now is going to be so taxing for those individuals. You know, we've talked so much about travel for the players, about from a nutrition standpoint and a health standpoint, a wellness standpoint, a homework standpoint, and all of these different angles. We haven't really talked a lot about travel of UCLA fans elsewhere. We've talked a lot about Big Ten fans and their ability to travel and pack the Rose Bowl. And Thriller, I don't know if you saw this the other day, that uh, Delta Airlines, I believe, has now created a a direct flight from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to LAX for that (laughs) Iowa-UCLA game. (laughs) So Delta is... (laughs) So we know they're going to travel to us, but there's a question of how much can the fans and the alums and the boosters travel all the way to the Midwest and, and to more of the eastern part of the country, now you still have that weekender, that opportunity to go to the Bay Area and the Bay Area folks to come down here and really create a lot of memories, camaraderie, spirit, and, and really continue that history and legacy. And then number three, Will, what I'll say is, I think now where the sport is going, we got a 12-team playoff here in, in the immediate future, but this is sort of extending now to a 14-team playoff. There is no longer an incentive for a school like UCLA to pack the non-conference as stacked as they need to, because now, given that they are in one of the two best conferences in the country, think about this, Will, 14-team playoff, you're probably getting four bids from the SEC, maybe five. You're probably getting four bids from the Big Ten. Uh, That's 90 or 14, and then the other conferences and the at-larges will fill out the other five. So all you really have to do now is to be able to finish top four in the Big Ten or position yourself in that at large from a rankings perspective to be able to do that. And so what's the incentive of playing a Georgia? What's the incentive of playing an LSU and having that extra loss and going down in the rankings when you have sort of enough on your resume already in the conference and have the legitimacy with the Big Ten brand to then be able to make the playoffs? So. I'm with you, Will. I'm very disappointed because of these sort of traditional matchups. Would be great to see Georgia, Athens, Georgia, and go to you know sort of Death Valley, LSU, and all of that. But I think if you take a step back and say, what's perhaps you know best for spirit? What's best for the fans? What's even best for UCLA in terms of positioning themselves now in a 14-team playoff world as opposed to a 14 playoff world? This makes a lot of sense. It does, just because of the traditions and rivalries, but. You know, I think to be the best, we, we've called ourselves a sleeping giant. 
I don't want to run from these games. You know what I mean? Like, this is Georgia. This is like your chance to really put a stamp on the college football world. Like, Deshaun Foster has been everything we've wanted where he's like, no, UCLA is the spot. Like, we just need to get it back. If we're truly the spot, let's go play the Georgias. Like, playing those type of caliber opponents and, like, listen, we have the rough schedule of LSU, Penn State, Oregon. You know what's going to be great for our team in the long run is playing those games and figuring out how to win those games. So for me, I'm frustrated with it. The funniest thing about all of this, though, like what makes me laugh to no end was Cal. The initial argument is like, how are you guys going to go to the Big Ten? Like it's so far away. You guys going to have to fly out. They're going to the Atlantic Coast Conference. <laughs> what, is, what is going on? You're going to have in-conference games against the Miami Hurricanes. Like, what are we doing here, dude? Like, it is no. it is absurd. So It's amazing, Will. And, and I think just look look with the passion and the intensity that you're speaking and, and the way that I'm speaking with so much passion. This rivalry with Cal, I would argue, is the highest that it's ever been. I mean, it, it's sort of paralleling USC at this point, just in terms of the recent history. If you look at the last two or three years and the feelings that we have towards Cal, I think it's very similar feelings to a USC of just everything we've had to sort of go through, uh, you know, from a persecution standpoint, Will, I mean, frankly, through this entire process with Cal kind of sticking their nose at us in this very elitist fashion, even though they claim to be such an inclusive university. So I think just this just dials up the intensity. You get fans of, of both schools to be able to cross over. I think it sort of enhances the experience, but I'm with you, Will. I mean, you and I obviously – more old school guys in terms of our thinking. Your guy, Steph Curry. My guy's Kobe Bryant. We're of sort of the Jordan tree. You know, we love that kind of the, the old Miami culture of the 80s and 90s where you say, you know, any, uh, we'll play you anywhere. Just roll the balls out and we know we're the better team. You remember Pat Hill in the early 2000s, Fresno State, anywhere, any place, anytime. That had so much respect on the West Coast of the United States and college football, just given that mentality. So we, from a mentality standpoint, it's all about to be the best, you have to beat the best. I think this is a little bit of a more rational approach that I think works, uh, but but something is lost. Now let's hope that in not being able to play Georgia and LSU in the non-conference, UCLA has positioned themselves in the regular season to be able to make the 14-team playoff and then perhaps see Georgia and LSU in the playoff, in round one, in round two, and then ultimately, you're, you're not going to be able to run to a title without going through these giants. So you're just, you know, as, as the saying goes, God doesn't deny. He's just delaying. He, we're just delaying. He's not denying. Hopefully, we're just sort of delaying and not denying the delicious matchups that we're going to have in the playoffs. Hopefully, delaying, not denying. I agree with that sentiment. Uh, let's do the quarterbacks, man. I think this is a fun exercise Garbers, I feel like our, our only question really with the offense was the offensive line. And yeah, it's four new bodies and that position group needs to gel more than just about any other position group on the football field to have a cohesive unit. But I'm feeling a lot more optimistic about the potential of this line than when we were in spring. So if that was the only question mark with the offensive line was protecting a guy like Ethan Garbers, I'm feeling more confident about that. Deepest receiving core. I mean, we've talked we've talked about it all off season. You guys are sick of hearing about this at this point. All off season, um, you know. So great receiving core. A lot of great stuff going on there. Um, I think he's got a shot to crack the top five. I'll give you my top five quarterbacks. You can kind of just you know intervene anytime you want when it comes down to this. My quarterbacks, and this is in order right now. I'm going. Believe it or not, hate me or love me. I'm going to put him in the top five. Tyler Van Dyke came close. Aiden Childs came close. Listen, you can hate Lincoln Riley. You can think he's underachieving like I am. But what this guy is the ultimate quarterback guru. It's like you can hate Chip Kelly, but you can't tell me he can't call a run game. Like These are just facts. These are not opinions. This guy has coached three Heisman Trophy winners in the last five years in college football. And the one guy who's considered like a disappointment is Spencer Rattler, who got drafted in the fifth round of the NFL draft. He's like the black sheep of the group. Like this guy, you know, unbelievable. So I got to put Miller Moss in there. His first game, he had six touchdowns in that bowl game. I think just how that offense is structured and how aerial the attack is for USC. I have him at number five. I think he's going to put up ridiculous numbers. Zachariah Branch. I mean, I hate that that guy is on USC. I think he's going to be phenomenal. 
He's going to be a beast. So I got him at number five. Will Rogers, dude, this guy is so quiet right now. I Not a lot of people are talking about him. And when you really break down the stats, over 12,000 yards passing his career, 94 touchdowns. And he's going to Jed Fitch, who is one of the better quarterbacks coaches that we have in college football, going to Washington. So I don't know anything about Washington, but what we do know is Jed Fitch is a hell of a football coach. <laughs> There's nothing to go off of with Washington. I, of I just players. love, I just love Will. I just love you tonight, Thriller. You know, it's just there's there's an edge to you tonight that is just intoxicating. Please continue. My man Please continue. To me before this. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? 94 touchdowns, 12,000 yards through the air. I'm a big, you know, Jedfish believer. You know, famously, I'm very happy how it turned out with Deshaun. I love having Deshaun. But if you guys remember earlier in the process when you know it wasn't going great with Chip, and we we're throwing out names. I was very high on Jed Fish coming to UCLA. That's a name I was very, you know, high on, really wanted him to come back to Westwood after doing his thing there. Well, uh, Will Howard, and this one is going to throw people off a little bit, but what I mean by this is no quarterback may have a better situation in college football than this guy. Oh, hand it off to Quinshawn Judkins or Travion Henderson. Oh, I'm going to throw it to one of my five future NFL wide receivers. I mean, they were showing the picture of C.J. Stroud, in that Rose Bowl game, it was like Jackson Smith and Jigba, Marvin Harrison Jr., Olave, Garrett Wilson. Like, unbelievable talent is there. They apparently got this kid, Julian Fleming, that was like the number one recruit last year. I just know this guy's going to have, like, studs out there on the outside. So I'm excited for our guy, Will Howard. Um, number two, I mean, this this is the most controversial one, Drew Aller. I know, you, I know how you feel about Drew Aller. I It was his first year really starting last year, 25 touchdowns, two interceptions. He was the number one high school quarterback coming out. This is not your Trace McSorley's. This is not, you know, your Sean Clifford's. You know what I mean? I think this guy's a little bit different than those guys. I still think he needs a lot more development. He misses a lot of throws. But, I mean, the arm strength and talent, I mean, my God, that guy has a rifle on his arm. So if he can just kind of maintain it, uh, I think he'll be pretty good at number two. And then my last one, and we can just kind of go in depth, on this uh, former UCLA transfer commit, Mr. Dylan Gabriel. I mean, this guy, you remember when Aaron Kraft was at Ohio State and it felt like he had been there for like two presidential terms. Dylan Gabriel has been in college football for like 15 of my like 31 adult years of my life. Like it's been insane how long this guy has played. He is within striking distance of Case Keenum's all-time yardage record of 19,000 yards. Uh, I think he's around like 15,000 yards passing, very much in play this year with a big run for Oregon. And by the way, those receivers, Tez Johnson, Evan Stewart, the number one uh, transfer portal wide receiver, that is big time. And then you've got it with Case Keenum, 155 career touchdown passes, the record. Dylan Gabriel's at 125. He had 30 last year. You just see maybe just a slight increase in that. He's the all-time record leader. You know what this guy is. I think he's one of the safest bets for Heisman, given what Oregon's going to be this year, if everything goes to plan with Dan Lanning and everything in co there. Dylan Gabriel, I just know what I'm getting. He's going to be a very solid quarterback. He's on his, like, third school. Could have been fourth if he ended up going to UCLA, but third at the time. I'm out of breath talking about these quarterbacks. <laughs> <laughs> you. Talk to me, man. What do you got with these quarterbacks? Get a sports talk. strength thriller. Get some Gatorade. Get some electrolytes. You know, you know let's recharge armor. the batteries. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Thriller, no, I'm I'm in uh, sort of violent agreement with you on a lot of these. Um, and I think I'm going to sort of give the one caveat here. I'm, I'm going to sort of give my list from five to one. And then we can talk through it. It's actually very similar. I've got, Drew Gar uh, I've got Garbers, Ethan Garbers at five. Yeah, baby. and I've got Garbers at five. I've got Moss at four. I agree with you. I have Rogers at three. I've got Howard at two, and I've got Gabriel at one. And I think to me, the big take is Aller. I don't have him in the top five right now. I think I've got Aller at six. And and the only reason I'm saying that is, again, we just have to sort of see it. Look, Ethan Garbers, when he was healthy. We saw him against USC. We saw him uh, in these games even last year, uh, you know, in terms of when we're talking about 2022 and 2023, uh, be, be put, putting games together. Aller, for me, Thriller, you know, granted, you know, Penn State wins these games in the Big Ten, but when it came time to, to playing Ohio State, when it came time to playing Michigan, 
you were talking about a guy that was sub 50%. You were talking about a guy with more interceptions than touchdowns. You were talking about a guy where there was just no credibility offensively in those games. Granted, now that's Ohio State and Michigan, but there was such a wide gap in terms of his performance in those big games versus the medium or little games. He hasn't done enough for me to sort of give him that credibility. Now, I I completely agree with you. I think he could very well slide in there. But based on what I've seen, Ethan Garbers is a top five quarterback in the Big Ten as long as he has the time to complete his throws. I think you said it best with Dylan Gabriel. My God. I mean, just look. Oregon is is sort of the Yankees and the Red Sox and the Dodgers put together in terms of payroll at this point. I mean, so we can talk about, obviously, threatening Keenum over, you know, five figures in terms of passing yards. He's crossed the 10,000 yards mark, played in some big games. Really, I think where he made a name for himself was really his excellent play at UCF, frankly. I mean, that's what really kind of set the stage, had his ups and downs in OU. But when you put a seasoned guy, lefty, can kind of make all of those soft throws, touch throws, and then throw it down the field with that litany of weapons, I mean, it's a frightening proposition. And I think the same thing goes for Will Howard. You know, when you talk about what he was able to do, at uh, people forget this. I mean, Kansas State beat TCU for the Big 12 title when, you know, two years ago when TCU made it to the national championship game. Will Howard took that team, won the Big 12. Now you put Will Howard with, all, with the Bugattis and the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis of the world at Ohio State. We could be having a conversation that Will Howard might end up being the top quarterback in the Big Ten. So I think those two have kind of separated – I love your take, Will, on on Rodgers. And when you put Rodgers in a Washington situation with Jetfish, I mean, look at what Jetfish was able to do with some of these project quarterbacks at Arizona, some of these more raw guys that we've seen the last couple of years and, you know, put together eight, nine win season. Now you're looking at a situation, 10 win season, Alamo Bowl. Now you're looking at a situation where he has a lot more resources, a lot more talent at Washington, and you overlay that with a, a seasoned quarterback that has a lot to prove, really like Rodgers. And then four, Miller Moss, I think you said it best, Thriller. Lincoln Riley, love him, hate him, think he's a top five coach, think he's a top, not a top 50 coach. I mean, he's, he's one of the most polarizing guys in the sport right now. Uh, you know, he's probably the most polarizing USC uh, individual this side of Bronny James over the last couple of weeks here. Uh, but I think that it's, it's undeniable what he's been able to do at the quarterback position. We know all about the three Heismans. We, uh, you know, we didn't even talk about the Heisman runner up. And then, of course, you know, poor Spencer Rattler, who got drafted in the NFL, being, you know, the, the fifth of that wheel. Uh, but I think Lincoln Riley, when you couple that with just Miller Moss's intelligence, Miller Moss is also a guy that can make a lot of the throws. You're probably going to see a lot more of an Oklahoma-style offense at USC this year um, in, in more of a traditional way. And then you got Garbers at five. I think I, I really love what I'm seeing here with Garbers. I think this notion that he's the 12th best quarterback or the 14th best quarterback or the 16th best quarterback in the conference, I think is a product of people not paying attention to West Coast football. And I will say one thing. I think UCLA, Oregon, USC, Washington – are going to surprise the Big Ten in a way, NWA surprised the music world, you know, back in the 80s. I'm telling you, I don't think people realize how good these four programs are and how good the Pac-12 was last year and how battle-tested these programs are. Big Ten, you know, you better get your popcorn ready. You better get the protective cup ready because these four quarterbacks and teams are coming. T.O. Jamal Madney. Get your popcorn ready. (laughs) T.O. Jamal Madney. We are signing off from our Friday show, guys. You guys have the best weekend possible. We're going to be back breaking down. I think we're going to do Big Ten football running backs next week. I, think that I love like it. I love it. I mean, of course, we're after we, we we got to preview the offensive line, the secondary, and the wide receivers. Well, I mean, that, you know, we got to do that. Yeah, first. yeah. <laughs> I don't think they've heard our Rico Flores take just yet. So we have, to, <laughs> we have to bring that one back to the table. You guys have a great one. Fours up. Ruined Bible. We are out.